Julian is so insightful that we've come back with part two of the YouTube, um, which is going to be about building his team. When you first started, did you ever think that you have a team of coaches working underneath you? Uh, I actually did. Really? If I'm honest. Yeah. Well, then. Yeah. Um, I, I think I just really wanted to to scale, to be honest. And also like, like obviously like I enjoy coaching. I love coaching, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, but I also realized that obviously expanding means working with multiple people. And obviously the route would have been, if we wanted to keep like a high ticket and a high quality service, the route would have been to hire people. Yeah. Like hire coaches. Otherwise you can't really scale. What are your decisions when you look to bring up? Cause you've, you've now got two coaches, right? Yeah. And one comes from the program. So it's an ex-client. Okay. And the other one are hired from outside the program. What's the differences in the two in the process? <laughs> Oh, uh, the, the, yeah, it's very different, very different. Um, I think, so obviously like there's pros and cons uh, with, with both. Uh, I think the pros uh, with bringing someone from uh, being a client to being a coach is the fact that they just really get it. They mm. really understand the program because they've done it. They really believe in a program because they transform themselves through it. And, uh, and they like just really passionate about it and perhaps they're probably a bit less ambitious mm. as well. Like they're just really happy to be working in a position and to be in the position where they are. Yeah. And I think if you bring someone from uh, from the, well the, the, the con well, the cons with that could be perhaps the level of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, they only know what you've taught them rather than exactly. having yeah. outside knowledge. Exactly. And perhaps like also take an initiative a little bit but that's probably more person dependent. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, the pros with obviously bringing someone from the outside is that you can hire someone that is actually fucking good at coaching. Yeah. And that's the case for Harry. Like he's a top coach. Um, so that's obviously one of the pros. He has a lot of ideas as well that he always brings to the table. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful. Uh, obviously the cons, if we can call them that with that or the things that perhaps at times we might be struggling with a little bit is like, understanding roles um, is obviously and really truly understanding the systems, not wanting to change the systems all the time mm. because he's obviously used to coach a his class way. a yeah. certain way and our systems might be slightly different. Um, but I think with that, it's just about, you know, having open conversations, make sure that the values align. That is a massive thing. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that I would look at hiring someone as a coach. You just kind of make sure that you have not even the same vision, but you have the same values. Yeah. You've got to believe in the same things. Um, otherwise, like at some point you're going to part ways, you yeah. know? Um, and that's not even if business goes well or not, you know? Um, yeah. I think that, I think there's a difference between values and ambition, right? Like yeah. if somebody's ambitious, but the values are the same as yours, I think the company can just grow an 100%. umbrella there, their ambition. But I think if their values lie elsewhere, Mm -hmm. you, you're right. Like no matter how successful the company, it's like, even if the company is very, very successful, that they're, they're going to go like this. So mm -hmm. they're not going to be covered by the success that you can create. Yeah. And I think that's, that's sometimes a difficult pill to swallow for, for people that they really want people to be part of the program. But again, it's, and I think coaches get that wrong. If I'm mm -hmm. honest, mm -hmm. coaches get that wrong because they look for people instead of looking for people's whose values align they look at people, they look for people whose ambition is low. Yeah. So that they don't really have any kind of pull either way. They're just happy to just kind of go along with it. Yeah. And then yeah. they complain that staff are like unmotivated and don't take initiative. And yeah, I'm having to, they're basically just, I'm having to do it myself anyway. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, bro, you look for the cheapest option that had yeah. the least yeah. ambition. What do you expect for people who have low ambition mm -hmm. and will work for fuck all? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. low quality work. Yeah, it's a lot. And I don't think you can have that in a coaching business. I think there is many places for that in society. Yeah. But, but as part of a small team 100%. as well, you can hide people like that in a large company. You can't in a coaching company. It's yeah. very, very apparent who those people are. Yeah, for sure. And we, I see it all the time, all the time. Coaches are, like, I'm not willing to pay that. And I'm like, okay, go, go find someone that, that'll, that'll yeah, work for that yeah, then. Like, yeah. I can't help you because we always look for high quality candidates, but like, if you want to, if that's what you want to pay, cool. Here's a list of places you can go find people that you can pay that to. Yeah. Three yeah. months later, it's always like, it's not working. It's not converting. The person's not doing the job right. They're not doing what I want them to do. Mm -hmm, it's like, mm -hmm. 
you can either get good or cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the thing. Like, obviously, I'm paying, I'm paying Harry and Steen as well. Like, quite a good rate. Mm. Um, but the messages that I get from the clients in the program saying how like good, yeah, you know, the coaching is how amazing. And when he sends me social proof, when he sends me the transformations, you know, it's just it's all worth it, you know. And I can see that obviously I'm spending more money. Like my margins perhaps are a little bit, you know, smaller. But at the same time. Uh, this gives us the opportunity to just grow a lot more. And and that's it, I think. And that's a really interesting point. So like, how do you feel about the difference in margin in the company? Because I, like, to be honest, saw, I had a couple of posts sent to me about somebody that was talking about margins saying like, oh, well, our coaching business runs at like 85 to 90% margins uh, and we've managed to get this far. Mm. But I know that they're doing absolutely everything themselves to the point mm. where it's causing stress breakdowns. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, you can have high margin, you can have really, really high margin, but I think there's a trade off with but, margin and work that you're getting back for the margin that you're giving away. But, but that's, that's the thing, like, what do you need margins for? Because in my opinion, I need margins, so I've got cash flow for the business. That's it. If, if you need margins because you wanna buy nice things for yourself, I think you got your priorities wrong. Well, I just think you're not really there to grow a business. You're just yeah. there to make money. Yeah. You've got to accept that as businesses grow and the margins are going to change. And, you know, that's one of the the choices that we make with, you know, when people go from like aiming for six figures to aiming for seven figures, like you can get six figures on very, very high margins. But if you want to, if you want to make, you know, say you want to go from like 8K a month to 20K a month, for example, mm -hmm. you're going to have to spend some money and get some help to get there. Yeah. Or you just have to going to take on a fucking absolutely catastrophic workload that is going to make you feel like you're in the fucking pit. But also it makes you wonder like how good can the quality of the service be at that point then, you know, if that's, you're doing everything that's, yourself. That's ego for me. That's yeah. ego. I'm I'm doing it all myself. Like, well, well done. <laughs> like, yeah. Nobody's going to give you a badge for that. Steve, no one give back Steve Jobs a badge and says, Steve, you did it all yourself, mate. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, the the best business owners and the and the best leaders in the world are, the, well, the best business owners I think are the best leaders mm -hmm. because one person can only take someone so far. Like you can only do it yourself to a certain extent mm -hmm. before you run out of time or you have to dilute the quality of your service so much that it, it breaks the business. But that's the thing, like when a new client comes on now, I'm so confident in, in setting the product with, with Harry as a coach because I know, I just know he's going to do a much better job than me as a coach. Yeah. Uh, and it's not even like about the skill set. It's just about the fact that I, I don't just do the coaching. Yeah. I do everything else in a business. So realistically, if you get a coach that only does the coaching and he's really passionate about it and that's all he does, you're going to get a much better service. Yeah. So I think, you know, to all the coaches that like struggle to sell the program, you know, uh, with themselves not necessarily being in it, I would say, you know, just focus on hiring someone that is really good. Or if they come in from the program, just focus on, perhaps I will spend a little bit of money on the coach doing an extra course exactly. you know, or something like that. It's an investment for the future of the company at the end of the day. So that, that can make you just so much more confident in selling the program with you not being in it and just having the coach actually handling it. Yeah. And I think that's like the training side of things of like spending time with your coaches and spending time with your staff. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people expect people to come in and just be like finished articles mm -hmm. and you're just asking for a unicorn. Like it's never going to happen. Like people are always going to need further education and support. And that's your job as a business owner is to make sure that you're here and you're bringing them as close to you and actually in certain aspects of the business better than you. Yeah. At yeah. things. And like, f like I remember me, like the first time I knew I had a business, right, is when we made content that I'd not planned, that I'd not posted, that went up, that was messaged by off our profile that somebody that's not me signed up on a sales call, got delivered to a coach. I'd never spoke to this person and they made 10 grand. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is now a business. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is now a business because I've not had to meddle in any part. I've set it all up and I've made sure the staff are there yeah. and I've done the training, yeah. but my actual physical hand on work has not had anything to do with that client's success. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a, this is a business now, mm -hmm. this can mm -hmm. work. And, and I think a lot of coaches like struggle to, to do that concept because they struggle to let go. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing. I think at some point, 
you know, I think the turning point is just really asking yourself the question, do you want to be a business owner or do you want to be a coach? Mm. If you want to be a coach, fair enough. And you want to like, you want to scale the business. Okay, fair enough. But I think realistically, you're going to have to delegate a lot of the tasks that have to do with driving the business forward, which is definitely more risky than, uh, than delegating and the, more the coaching. Expensive. Yeah, for sure. I just think there's a ceiling. If you take that route, there's a ceiling. Like, but then like, if you like coaching, just go work f for someone, no? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, listen, there's nothing wrong yeah. with like having a coaching business yeah, and making yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. can probably, depending on the price point you can get, and that will, that will vary this number. Mm -hmm. Let's say you can get 300 quid a month for your services. Mm -hmm. You can probably handle somewhere between 40 and 50 clients. Yeah. So let's say you could do 15 grand. After that 15 grand, everything is going to affect your either mental health or quality of service. And you'll have to sacrifice those things mm -hmm. to get further. And there will be a point where one of those two things runs out. Either you break as a human and you can't take any more and, and you burn out mm -hmm. or the quality of service gets so diluted, you become one of those coaches where they'll be like, oh, they were good mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. two years ago yeah, before yeah, they got yeah. really busy, before they got big. The yeah. only way I think you can do it without the business owner crumbling or the business model crumbling or having to launch lower and lower ticket offers to kind of like grab a bit more money of like, you know, programs that you don't think are really going to work. Like, oh, I'll do eBooks now because I can sell it and I don't have to do anything. You can probably claw a little bit back. Unless you're a fucking celebrity, I really don't think that people are going to make 30, 40 grand a month without hiring a team and doing it this way. Yeah, of course. And again, it, it's what we were saying earlier. It comes down to the quality of the service as well. Plus like, Anything that like, I don't care how much you love something, if, if you just do it to the point that, you know, like you just start hating it, maybe not hating it, but it just, you know, you start to not enjoy it as much. It becomes numb, doesn't yeah, it? It's like, yeah. oh, another day of doing. Yeah. I do. I, at one point I was doing 92 check-ins yeah. when I was like, oh, yeah. fuck that. Yeah. And I was making good money. We were charging last, yeah. 250 pound a month doing 92 check-ins. Yeah. So I was making, you know, north of 20 grand a month on my own. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but literally like it was groundhog day every mm -hmm. day. It was mm -hmm. like wake up, content, check-ins, content, bed. Yeah. Like there wasn't even lead gen. We were just doing that. I was, you know, if that had dried up for us, we'd have been fucked because I wouldn't have had any more time to give. Luckily we had like a good stream of people coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, I did like two months of that. And I was like, that was at the start of COVID. And I was like, fuck this. Yeah. Never again. But yeah, what would you, what would be your then biggest tips of people looking to? If you, imagine you're a coach, right? You're full on clients yourself, and you're a bit wary about hiring a team. What would be your three things for them? Um, well, I would say um, again, like just just like choose choose uh, choose people, like choose the coaches wisely, um, based on align your values. Well, getting someone that is aligned with your values, I think that more than anything else. Um, also try to understand to what point you want to delegate uh, the coaching side of things. Um, if you want to find someone to completely delegate the coaching to, you got to find someone that is really, really good. And if they're not amazing, you might want to spend a bit of money training them for them to actually become really fucking good at it. Um, so I think, yeah, I think at that point, again, it's, it's down to the fundamental question of asking yourself how much coaching you want to do. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, hiring the, the, the right people based on, on your values and where you see the company going. And those things will change. That's also a reality, you know? Uh, like people change. So the coach that you hire might have the same values the, the, the moment that you start and then they develop into something else. They do their own thing and then they change their values and it's the same for the company. So uh, these are things that you constantly want to assess and you definitely want to kind of have an eye for the future. So as soon as you see that there's a bit of contrast in that sense, or oh, I believe this, you believe that, we don't quite align anymore. You definitely want to address that straight away. You don't want to find yourself in a position where the coach has fucking 60 clients and, and uh, yeah, like they don't want to work with you anymore. Yeah. That, that's the right mess. But yeah. Sure. Really good advice. So if you want to have a look at kind of like Julian's journey and see what's going on with his business, they can find you at? Um, Instagram at julian.solai, S-O-L-L-A-I. -L -L <laughs> For the third time. Um, <laughs> And yeah, if you want to know more about how to grow a business, learn more about how to get clients, keep clients, train clients, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to notify when we do more videos and I'll see you next time.